This episode is brought to you by Snapple. Want to know another Snapple fact? The first hot air balloon passengers were a sheep, a duck, and a rooster. Ridiculous. Check out Snapple.com to find ridiculously flavored Snapple near you. I'm hard on Sam Altman when it's appropriate. I'm interested in what he's doing when it's appropriate. Elon and my relationship is perfect. He was fascinating for the longest time. You know, and a lot of people are like, you should have known. I said, he wasn't like that. He changed. And when he changed, I started saying, stop it. And then I said, you fucker. Did that benefit me? It would benefit me to talk to him. But he changed, and I didn't want to do that. This is Death, Sex, and Money. The show from Slate about the things we think about a lot talk about more. I'm Anna Sale. Death, Sex, and Money was live from New York at the Tribeca Festival earlier this month. And the idea for our show was to explore the craft of getting people to open up and tell you things. I think about this a lot and have a distinct style I've developed on this show. And I wanted to talk to people who do it differently than me. Fast-talking, pugnacious tech journalist and podcast host Kara Swisher joined me, as did psychoanalyst Dr. Orna Goralnik, who you may know from the wonderful show Couples Therapy. She joined me on stage with her dog, Nico. The three of us really do have different communication styles, as you'll hear. And I learned a lot, too. I think you'll enjoy listening in on the whole thing. Hello, everyone. I'm Anna Sale. I'm the host of Death, Sex, and Money, the show about the things we think about a lot and need to talk about more. I am so thrilled to be here at Tribeca Festival with all of you, and also at this this cool event that Tribeca asked us to do, which is to take seriously the craft of interviewing. Um, What happens when you are forging a relationship and gathering new information at the same time? The skill that's involved in that. And we have two really special guests of people who approach that challenge with slightly different styles. Kara Swisher is here with us, tech journalist, legend, entrepreneur, best-selling author of Burn Book, her latest book. She's going to be with me in a few minutes. And before that, I'm going to talk with Dr. Orna Goralnik, who, for four seasons on couples therapy, have led all sorts of couples, and in the fourth season, also a polycule, through therapy sessions about what's really happening between them. And this is a show that I really love because it it doesn't flinch from the stuff that can make our relationships painful, combustible, and also so life-giving. There are conversations about violence, conversations about the impact of neglect and abuse, and also conversations that take seriously the ways that dishes and division of household tasks can corrode the way that we're able to live together and love one another. And Dr. Orna Gralnik is, I think, one of the most profound listeners to watch at work. The camera will be right on her face, and you see when she's taking in a nugget of information, you can see when she furrows her brow, and then you can see when she's going to just come through with that follow-up. Tell me more about that. What just happened there? Um, It's a thrill to watch. Before I call her to the stage to talk about how she approaches her work, I want to give you all an assignment. This is a conversation about what happens in an interview. So I want you to notice how they talk about their craft. And I want to read a quote to you that I first learned from NYU professor Rebecca Hamowitz, who teaches a class called The Art of the Interview. And at the top of her syllabus, when I saw it, it had this quote that really I just love from Lawrence Grobel. To conduct a good interview, you must converse like a talk show host, think like a writer, understand subtext like a psychologist, have an ear like a musician, be able to select the best parts like an editor, and know how to piece it together like a playwright. 
think of all that that happens all in one conversation. And then the other thing I want you to kind of honor is in an interview, you are seeing a conversation that is happening in real time. You are seeing something that hasn't happened before. And I like to think of it as relational improv. So think of all of that while we're talking up here about what it is to interview. Please welcome Dr. Orna Kralnik. This is Nico, yeah. who's joining Nothing us on stage. Nothing would happen without the queen. <laughs> I want to ask you first about where you start. Because one of the things I think a lot about when I'm creating the arc for an interview is, oh, if I start in the wrong place, it can lead us in a direction where I, don't, I want to control what's going to happen over the course of the conversation. Do you get to ask the first question in a session? I'd rather not. Um, I do if the person I'm speaking with is too, doesn't know how to use the space, doesn't ha know how to use the time, and gets kind of frozen and stuck, then I help. But ideally, I want to create as much of a, um, in, in Keats language, like a negative space um, to let the other person come with whatever they need to. Uh-huh. I do want to know why, because say it's somebody you've been seeing for some time, mm -hmm. you know what happened last week mm -hmm. in the session, you know where you want to pick up next, why don't you start there? Okay, um, we're going to go straight into Let's psychoanalytic theory. <laughs> <laughs> like, why waste time? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, that's a good interview question. You see, you already got me uh, going you. straight to the heart <laughs> of things. Thank you. <laughs> Um, when you approach the work psychoanalytically, what you're really trying to do is, um, I think that would be clear. Like you, you try to get beyond all of our defenses, both the interviewee, whether it's a client or a patient or the person I'm talking to and my own, we're trying to get beyond the defenses and in certain ways, get beyond the obvious and to let, in a way, create a space where surprises can happen, where the unconscious can show itself. So there are all sorts of techniques to do that. Um, there's, um, there's a famous British psychoanalyst, Wilfred Behan, who talked about approaching each session with no memory and no desire as an analyst. Because when you come into a session full of the memories of what happened yesterday or what you talked about yesterday, you're already imposing what is known already and not leaving a space for the unconscious to show itself and there might be big surprises. So it's about creating the space for unfurling yeah. by not overly producing. Yeah. Do you think of what you're doing as interviewing? Not really, no, although I can understand why you would ask that. Um, well, I'm like full of like people in my head suddenly, but um, Harry Stuck Sullivan, who's a, an American psychoanalyst, he talked about the psychoanalytic session, he talked about the detailed interview. So he did think of it as an interview in a way, and he talked about the importance of actually eliciting a lot, a lot of details, getting into the minutia of a person's life to get to the essence. So there is a way to think about it as an interview, but I, that's not how I think about it. I, I think about it more as creating a space where things can happen mm -hmm. between us. And when you're getting to know, say, a couple, mm -hmm and you are just collecting information, what kind of conflicts they are having trouble with, mm -hmm. um, you know, maybe what kind of work they do if money is a stress. Um, when, you're, when you're doing that early stage of, of getting to know you questions, are you thinking about, let me map them by collecting these facts, or is it more like, I'm going to ask you these um, preliminary questions 
to see how you talk about it? What, what are you paying closer attention to? Usually at some point I want to get some mapping of information, but I, I don't start there. I, I start with as little direction as the couple can tolerate so that they can um, exhibit what they're coming with. And that could be in the form of actual concrete information, or it can be, as you're asking, in the form of like how they talk. How they, for example, if one of them always starts and the other interrupts. Or um, if one of them says something and immediately looks to the other for validation. Or, you know, how they start their sentences. There's a lot of how that uh, a couple does that gives me a huge amount of information that sometimes is in line with what they're saying, sometimes it contradicts what they're saying, and that is super interesting. Yeah, so there's a lot of information in the way people behave that is very important for a therapist to clock. And how much of that that you're observing, that you're watching, do you tell them you're no you're noticing? Because I imagine there's this risk. Not a of, lot. Not a lot. Not a lot. Unless, I mean, timing and when when to collect information is very important in therapeutic work. I mean, if you just say everything that you're seeing, it's just, people cannot make use of it. Also, you can't make use of it. You have to, you're collecting information in all these different ways. And then at some point, they form a pattern in you and in me as a therapist. And there are certain key moments when delivering that information is useful. Most of the time it's not useful. And tell me about how you think about pacing. When you have enough information to know where to push, mm -hmm. um, what are the considerations you have before you decide to make that statement that you know, either could be viewed as a challenge or be, be viewed as a, I don't know, could upset the dynamic. Um, what are the things you think about about when to do that? Um, I think, I, first of all, I have to have enough of a rapport with people before I say anything or offer an interpretation. Um, so I, I need to establish sort of a, a basic relationship with my people. Mm -hmm. um, and then I need to, sort of similar to what you're saying, I need to assess their level of readiness and what where their defenses are. We all have defenses. We all have things that are difficult yeah. to talk about. And I kind of walk around the edges and feel my way. <clears throat> what is too much and what is just right? What is like the Goldilocks point? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, that's probably similar to. It, well, your... how I think about it, it's interesting. Is um, I, I, for me, it's when I know I have to ask a question because the listener is going to expect me to ask this question. Um, but I have to. The, the for me, the calculation is if I ask it here or in this way, is it going to threaten the buy-in that this person has to keep sharing with me? So I, I'm, I'm sort of navigating around that during yeah, an interview. It's, it's similar. We're just calling it different names. I call it defenses. You call it buy-in. Yeah. Yeah. And, and do you find, like when you think of buy-in, for example, like say you, say there's a couple mm -hmm. where one person is clearly the dominant person in the relationship and you know that you need to make them aware of the way that they're bigfooting their partner in ways that are, it's not great. Um, and you, you suspect that maybe that information won't be received warmly. <laughs> um, what's, how do you do that? Um, well, there is, you know, I I, um, <clears throat> I work with not only thinking about individuals when I work with a couple, but I, I see a couple as a system. So um, 
if one person is dominating, the other person is submitting or calling for that. And if I feel like the, the person who's, quote, dominating is not ready to tackle that dynamic, I'll go for the complementary part and ask the other person, how are you doing with this? Or I'll try to, I'll find who in the couple is ready to work on something and engage them. Uh-huh. So. Does that feel fair? Fair in terms of, no, it's often not fair. Uh-huh. It's, there's, I, that's a lot of what couples have to tolerate in working as a couple, because sometimes you have to lean on the person who's ready to hear an interpretation and you let someone else off the hook for a long time. And it's not fair. I mean, it's good for the system overall. They have to trust that I know what I'm doing, but sometimes it's not fair. What has it been like for you as a practitioner to have your practice not only observed by your clients and patients, but by a camera and a public? Um, are there ways that, have you felt more um, exposed somehow or uh, I don't know, like things like that dynamic you just described about mm -hmm. leaning on the person who's more ready, um, where you feel it's made you think about your, your technique in ways that when you were doing it in a private office when no one was watching, um, that it's different. Interesting. Um, I'm not at all sure that's what you're asking. I can just tell you what came to my mind. Sure. Um, I've had situations where, let's say I'm, uh, this is on camera situations where it's on the show, not in my private practice, where um, I'm, le let's say it's a couple, like a hetero couple, and the woman is doing, I might be making it up a little bit, but just for simplicity, the woman is doing a lot of the chores and the childcare and the home care and, and bringing in the money, and, and the man is like passive, and, and, but also fragile, and I'm doing a lot of work with a woman who's more um, resilient and capable of doing some of the work with the idea that it's okay. I know, I know what I'm doing and I'm eventually going to get him to come along, but I have to lean on her a lot because she's the capable one right now. And in my private practice, I know what I'm doing and I'll, I'll deal with it. But sometimes when I know it's on camera, sometimes I have this thought, oh gosh, I'm like betraying the um, feminist agenda yeah. here. Um, I hope this is not sending the message that on top of all the work she has to do at home, she also has to do the work of therapy and, and the emotional labor. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know if I'm going to get to explain all of that. Mm -hmm. um, so that might be a concern. Uh -huh. Yeah. <laughs> Is it ever helpful? Was that what you were asking? Yes, okay. yes. Okay. Because then you're aware of an audience now in the way that right. a podcast interviewer right. is aware of I, an I audience. I have a responsibility towards um, the viewer and not only to the couple. Yes. Yes. And is it ever useful to tell a couple, I'm going to talk with you now about this and I will come to you, like to, to, to make plain and uh, explicit yes. your process? yes. I think it's very useful, yes. Yeah, I often narrate my technique out loud to people to understand why I'm doing something. Uh -huh. um, I think it's respectful mm -hmm. for people to explain what I'm doing rather than appear like this like omniscient clinician that's like delivering from Oz. Uh-huh, yes. I want to ask you generally about um, therapy speak showing up in your practice. Um, I have an awareness as an interviewer, just talking to people about their lives. Now versus 10 years ago, I hear a lot about, well, I set this boundary and I did this, or it felt like this person was gaslighting me, or you see it on social media, not just in conversations. 
we we have the uh, g- g- great privilege of editing, um, mm-hmm. and often in our show, we will you sort of can see this paragraph in the transcript, and we call it "Oh, that's therapy speak." And then Anna asked a question where she said, "Well, tell me more specifically what was happening in your life." So then they get back into storytelling mode as opposed to talking about um, how they're doing things and what they think is a very healthful way, but in a very uh, kind of just opaque way that doesn't feel real. Is this happening with people in your practice? Yeah, I totally relate to that. Yes. And it, and it, there's you a think that's good? Do you think that's good that there's like a migration of therapy language and into the way people think about their narratives? Or do you think it's getting in the way? I, I think anytime people use language to not talk, <laughs> which is a lot... <laughs> It's not good. Uh-huh. <laughs> um, and therapy speech can be can be used just as defensively as any other speech. Um, it, it's just like therapists can use diagnoses to not talk to a person. Uh. There are all sorts of ways that we all use language to obfuscate rather than speak. Um, but there's also ways that therapy talk can be inviting and... and create change that that I think is useful, like the, the fact that people are paying closer attention to what happened earlier in life as it shows up now, that mm-hmm. whole idea, it's not, it didn't used to be part of the culture and now it is. Um, you know, I have kind of a, a mixed reaction to the ways people use the word trauma now um, or being triggered. I mean, some of it is useful, like the idea that we're more vulnerable than we think is a good thing to introduce into culture. But the idea that everything is intolerable and needs needs a trigger warning and everything is traumatic is not helpful. So it depends. I find sometimes when I'm doing an interview, one tactic I have is to uh, offer some way a personal example from my own life. Often it's, oh, I have kids too, minor in elementary school, or, oh God, I know, like when I, uh, early marriage, it was blah, 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 blah. Like some, I often use it to demonstrate that it's okay they're describing mess, to say we all have mess of some sort, or I will use it in a way to say, I grew up in West Virginia, so I don't know what it's like to grow up in New York City, so I might have this off. So I, I will do it that way to to create a, a way for us to draw a line about how we're different. Do what's your? Do you find yourself using personal examples in session ever from your own life? Generally, no, I don't. Um, I'm not. I mean, generally, analysts are trained not to self-disclose. For can you tell me why? Like, what's the thought? <laughs> you're, Is asking, this you're asking in this like. <laughs> Reveal the secret. No, <laughs> well, I, I, I'm sure there's a reason. Yeah, there are but plenty of yeah, reasons. Yeah. Um, the classic reason, which still holds some validity, is the idea of neutrality. We call it neutrality. The idea that uh, you want to leave, you want to present. I mean, it's it's almost laughable to say it, but you want to present as a blank screen and leave a lot of room for patients to project whatever they need to project onto you, so you can get to know their unconscious. So for example, if they had like a, um, I don't know, a very paranoid parent, yes, they will project onto you like the object of paranoia. I'm saying it's almost laughable because even though it's, it's true that we all project constantly right and left, it's also true that none of us are blank screens ever. I mean, Whoever's sitting in a room with us can see the color of our skin, the the class we our clothes represent, the whatever is peeking out of the bag. I mean, we're never a blank screen, so it's it's both a, yes and no. The idea of neutrality, but there are other reasons not to disclose um, material. I mean, one is every time you're talking about yourself, you're possibly asking your patient or your interviewee 
to take care of you a little bit. Like you're giving them information that they need to then do something about. Uh And ideally you want your patient to sit there and not have to worry about me in this case. Again, it's I'm, I'm saying something that's extreme because to some degree they do have to worry. They're talking to another person and it has to be a tolerable experience for both participants. Um, but that's the general direction. Why not disclose? Not to burden. Not to burden. Yeah. Oh, interesting. On the other hand, when you say something like, I'm not from middle America, or I didn't grow up here, so I I don't necessarily understand you. I think that's actually a very useful thing to say. It's not a burdensome thing to say. It's it's respectful, and it's acknowledging a certain difference that needs to be acknowledged. So uh, there's no hard rule. We are coming to the end of our time, and... Nicely said. Thank you. I hate that sentence. Oh, God. I always have more to say. Um, we are coming to the end of our time. And I want to ask you actually about, uh, about that. Because for me, when I'm finishing an interview, particularly one where I know that we dredged up some stuff, um, I have thought it's developed over the years how I think about what our ethical responsibility is for aftercare. Mm-hmm. And I wonder when your sessions are over and something has come up 15 minutes before the top of the hour and you have to say goodbye, um, what is the way you think of aftercare? Or do you think you have a responsibility for aftercare? You mean for how the patient is doing in between sessions? Like or, at the or end just of- what happens in the next two hours, you yeah. know, or. Yeah. The, I, of course I have responsibility for that. Um, I, uh, you develop, as a therapist, you develop a very acute awareness of time, of the time of the session. So towards the latter, let's say, third of the session, the, the death of the session is in mind. Uh, uh-huh. um, so you start thinking about it, and you prepare for it, and sometimes you prepare the patient for it. You're like, we, we have 10 more minutes to go. How are you feeling? I mean, with patients that have a hard time with endings or in the middle of, like, a lot of turmoil, you might prepare them and say, just so you know, there's we have X number of minutes left. How are you doing? Mm-hmm. On the other hand, sometimes it's okay to just say, our time's up, with the knowledge that we're meeting tomorrow or we're meeting Friday or I'm holding it in mind. Yes, and and maybe allowing them to experience what to it is feel to hold discomfort. feelings. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Dr. Orna Gronick, this is our time. Thank you for your work. Thank you, Thank you for letting us in. It's such a pleasure to meet you. Get ready for a change in energy, maybe. We'll see. (laughs) She's here. This is Kara Swisher. She's come out on stage. I had a whole transition to call you up on stage to um, talk about how you also are a famous couples uh, interviewer. Yeah. um, If you think of Bill Gates and Steve Jobs. Yes, that's great. I do couples. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, they were quite a couple. Um, I was just thinking, first of all, I didn't bring a fucking dog. That was, should have done that. But I took the train, so. This message is sponsored by Greenlight. As your kids get older, some things about parenting get easier, and others don't, like having that conversation about money, how people get it, and what they do with it. The fact is, kids won't really know how to manage their money until they're in charge of it, and that's where Greenlight can help. 
Greenlight is a debit card and money app made for families. Parents can send money to their kids and keep an eye on kids' spending and saving, while kids and teens build money confidence and lifelong financial literacy skills. My kids are getting to the age where we need more of a plan than just saving wads of cash from grandparents in a pretty wallet and then blowing it all on a toy or a necklace. And when I was at this stage, my mom took me to our local bank branch and set up a savings account for me, and I got this little ledger to track my steady allowance deposits with a pen. The Greenlight app helps parents walk their kids into money management for how the world works now. You can set up an allowance to arrive like a direct deposit and then split it between accounts, spending, savings, and giving. There's a chores feature where you can set up a one-time or recurring chores customized to your family's needs. With the Greenlight app and debit card, kids can track how they save and spend, and they can also learn how to invest and earn interest, thanks to games that teach money skills in a fun, accessible way. And what's important to me is it prompts conversations about money that I might skip without this tool guiding us through. Sign up for Greenlight today and get your first month free when you go to greenlight.com slash DSM. That's greenlight.com slash DSM to try Greenlight for free, greenlight.com slash DSM. The term nuclear family was coined by an anthropologist in the 1920s to describe the family structure of a straight married couple and their kids. Well, now over a century later, only about 18 percent of Americans actually live in a family by that definition. That means that over 82 percent of Americans represent different kinds of family. From This Is Actually Happening comes the 82 percent modern stories of love and family, a special six-part podcast series focused on those who have broken away from the norm and challenged society's notions of what a family can be. From an asexual educator and activist raising a child with two other co-parents to a gay man in the clergy who chose the path of celibacy and created a unique family unit with his straight best friend, each episode offers an intimate first-person perspective from those whose family lives have taken different shapes. To listen to the 80 Two percent series follow this is actually happening on the Wondery app or wherever you get your podcasts. You can listen to this is actually happening ad free on Wondery Plus. This episode is made possible by PwC. It's getting hot out here. Moving the mercury can help move your business. PwC helps turn sustainability theory into real world action. Reduce your carbon footprint while increasing transparency in net zero commitments. Start with reporting to identify your climate risks and reinvent your business. Create a more sustainable business and a stronger planet. It's all part of The New Equation. Learn more at thenewequation.com. This is Death, Sex, and Money from Slate. I'm Anna Sale. As you heard, before I could even introduce her, Kara Swisher ran on stage at our live show. Rushing to the action before other people get there is what she does, and it's how she built an unrivaled career as a tech journalist. She wrote about that in her best-selling memoir, Burn Book, A Tech Love Story. Kara currently hosts two podcasts, Pivot with Scott Galloway and the interview show On with Kara Swisher, where she interviews high-profile people in business, tech, and politics. At Tribeca, Kara and I launched in by talking about perhaps her most high-profile interview ever when she interviewed Steve Jobs and Bill Gates on stage together in 2007, when both were at the height of their powers in tech. There was something of a rivalry between them, and before they were scheduled to go on together, Steve Jobs was doing a solo interview on stage where he took a dig at Gates, pointing out how many customers liked to use Apple's apps even when they were using Microsoft Windows. How does that feel? Oh, we've, we've got cards and letters from lots of people that say that iTunes is the, their favorite app on Windows. Uh-huh. But, I mean, I, I knew you... I knew you, we, you know, I think here at D actually... It's like giving a glass of ice water to somebody in hell. (laughs) So he essentially called um, Bill Gates the demon, a demon, (laughs) essentially, the devil. And I was backstage with the PR person from Apple and the PR person, and we're like, oh, shit. Like, oh, no, because Steve is just, Steve always liked to pants Bill Gates constantly. Uh It was his favorite thing. He was sort of smirky, 
remember. His I think smart. you wrote in your book, Steve Jobs just fucked us. Fuck us. Yes, that's what head. I thought. Yes. And uh-huh. so what happened was we get backstage and and Bill walks in and Bill already has communications problems as he just is. He rocks. He does. He has a you know those typical techie kind of affects, and he's usually not particularly articulate in general, but now he was silent. And so we're like, oh, great, we'll have to do the biggest interview of our career, and Bill Gates is not speaking, like, at all. And so I would ask him a question, and he'd go, "Mm mm-hmm, no, because he had heard about it, you know. And again, Steve Jobs embarrassed him, which he, Steve, liked to do for some reason. And um, and so we uh, so he's sitting back there rocking and being monotone, and we were like, oh, this is terrible. Steve walks in, jaunty as can be, smiling like, hey, 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 hey. I, I screwed him again. Uh-huh, like, uh-huh. And, um, and he sits down, and Bill is being monotone, and Steve is sort of giggling, the whole thing. These are adult men, yeah, right? Yeah. And, um, and suddenly, someone, we ask a different question, Bill won't respond, and we're like, we want this to be high level. We'd like you to, get, like, to talk about the big issues facing tech. And he, um, he, he, we said something, and finally, Bill goes, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. I mean, I run hell, you know. Like, uh-huh. So he referenced it. Steve Jobs, I don't know how he did this, had a bottle of water just like this, and it was icy. And it was dribbling with ice condensation. And he goes, here, let me help you. <laughs> and he handed him the thing. And it broke the ice, so to speak. But then we get on stage, and I thought, oh, phew. And we have this really high-level discussion. So the first one I did was a pretty easy one. And I go, what's something... That you don't, that people don't know about your relationship uh-huh. over the many decades. That's a nice question, to right? Open. Easy, uh-huh. right? Easy question. And Steve looks at him and he starts to do the smirk, and I'm like, "Oh no!" And he goes, "Well, for a long time now, Bill and I have been deeply in love and married." <laughs> and Bill Gates doesn't know what to do because he's again not a quick thinker the way Steve Jobs is. And so Bill's going, I could see his face going, "I'm not gay. I'm not gay, but." <laughs> I can't say I don't think gay is good because that's bad, and but I'm not gay. And you could see him like, and he goes like this, <laughs> and then Steve smirks. And and, and what do you do as an interviewer? You're just like, I think I'm this is perfect on. for Kara Swisher. Okay. It's all good for me. It's not bad. <laughs> like, you know. Okay, I anyway. want to back up a little bit because I I think of you as a journalist mm-hmm. who is, I don't know when you're not interviewing. It's, yes. It, 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 and I, I think, do you have your phone with you? Yes, I do. It's right. It's my favorite relationship still. Well, um, would what do you, you mind, think about, like, doctor? Can you can you take a can you take a look at your texts? I'm just curious. Like, has today been a texting day? Yes, I only text. And has it been with a lot of a lot of people, I both tell professional you. sources and? No, it's just gossip. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh huh. Uh, let's see. Here we go. My team at Pivot. A woman who did a, a documentary called A War Game, which is about war gaming, which I'm going to do a panel on uh-huh, Friday about uh-huh. it. Christiane Amanpour. I'm not going to tell You're you. You're texting which. with her. Of That's I am. cool. Uh, Brian Chesky. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Some friends. Audie Cornish, who's a very good. Tina Brown. Uh-huh. Um, this is all today. Apple, people from Apple. Okay, I'm impressed. His name rhymes with book. Um, <laughs> Matt Bellany. Um, Different people, just different people, yeah. Kevin Wheel, who just got the job being chief product officer of OpenAI. This is just today. Yeah. So I text with everybody. I, I want to know the the terms. I just got Sally Busby's cell. <laughs> oh, <laughs> we interesting. Had we had lunch discussing. This what is th- the former editor of the yes. Washington Post. We were trying to figure out what a third newsroom is. Ah. I oh. don't know what the second newsroom is. This is the plan by Will Lewis. <laughs> just jump over the second to the third. Yeah, Why is no one asking good. that question? Anyway. Um, Think about it. What's the second newsroom? Is he talking about editorial? Because that's not a newsroom, correct? Anyway. So before we move to the Washington Post, I want to talk to you. I think these guys are smart, I, and they're not. Well, let's, let's, I want to know about the way that you can say something like that and yeah. have people still text you. Yeah. Um, so do you find, like, when you ha- say a longtime friend. Yeah somebody who works for Apple, for mm-hmm. example, do you have a conversation at some point to say, when, I, when, this, when something's on the record, I'm going to tell you I'm going to report it? Or 
well, you know, how do you establish so the terms? So I'm not a beat reporter anymore, right? right? So it's different. If you're a beat reporter, you have to create a relationship where you're But talking. even when you were, you well, were had, you know, you were friendly with people who you were reporting friendly on. Friendly is different. Than fr- Look, uh-huh. a reporter is, as you know, Joan Didion's written this, lots of people, you know, we are charmers and we are trying to, there's this level of seduction involved, not that kind, because I'm not interested in any of them, but... Um, There's a level of like relationship. And I think one of the reasons I've been really successful is because I'm willing to have a a longer term relationship with these people. So I tend to try to find out a lot of stuff about their marriage, their children, their lives beyond as human beings. And so I tend to know a lot about people. I also ask people about things that have nothing to do with either their current crisis or their job. Uh What do you think about this? I just read this. I also know a lot of stuff. And One of the things about these individuals, especially the moguls, I know more than they do about the other moguls, right? Right. And they don't really hang out together. And Mm -hmm. so, you know, like many years ago, um, uh, Mark Zuckerberg was like, is Elon crazy? Well, he doesn't know him. What'd you say? Yes. Uh Um, And... But I do. I've spent a lot of time with him. So I think one of the things is I have a lot of information about a lot of people and just like anyone else, even if they're the richest people in the world, there's levels of insecurity, there's levels of not knowing. They're not sure, who, especially when you get that rich, you don't know who to trust. Yeah. Um, and I don't have any skin in the game with them. I don't, I'm not their friend, and I'm also not, um, I don't want anything from them necessarily. I don't necessarily benefit from them. And so in a weird way, I'm an honest broker because I'll but tell don't them. don't you benefit? Like when you benefited from scoops or benefited from being perceived as having closer access than other but, journalists? But see, that's, that was a really interesting thing. That was in the New York Times, which was inaccurate. I, if you point to me where I was easy on them, right? Exactly. Like it, when you have access, you're supposed to be really nice to them. I don't think that's my reputation, right? I think I'm honest with them. And when I like something, I say I like it. When I don't like it, I don't like it. A good example of that is um, I was meeting Zuckerberg, which he doesn't meet with me that much anymore because of all his disastrous interviews with me, his fault. Um, They are. They're his fault. They're not my fault. You know, he didn't have to say Holocaust deniers don't mean to lie to me. Wait, let's pause there. So that is a story. You didn't where you were interviewing him. You, yes. I feel like a hallmark of your style is mm-hmm. a very fast pace. Yes. And, and that was an example where he started talking about Holocaust deniers. Well, no, and, we were talking about Alex Jones. I was complaining to him, and I think a lot of reporters do. Some people say that Alex Jones is a problem on your platform. I look at him and say, you have rules on your platform and that asshole Alex Jones keeps breaking them. Why do you keep him on here? I think you should take him off. He's not used to that. So right? you said that. Yeah. And then Mark Zuckerberg started talking in response. Yes. And you made the calculation as you write in your book. Mm-hmm. Oh, I'm going to let him keep speaking right. here. Right. Because what was the point? If By letting him Here's follow what the is. thread, First, what did he say? we were talking about Alex Jones and why Facebook had rules and, and Alex kept breaking them, and they let let them stay on the platform. So I wanted to understand, do you have rules that you let some people break? Do you really not have rules? Why do you have rules at all if you're just going to let them run rampant over them? Just yeah. curious, since you're the king. <laughs> just curious. <laughs> just, you're the king. You yes. know, nobody can change the rules but you, but you won't enforce the rules, so why do you have rules at all, which you don't have, right? That was what I was trying to get to with him. And so we were discussing that, and in the as I wrote the book, he goes... Um, he goes, let's shift to Holocaust deniers. And I was like, oh, that's a problem for you. One, because it was a minor of mine in college, Holocaust studies. So I was like, I know a little bit about this and propaganda. And I don't think you know anything, right? He's just, a lot of these tech moguls, they like pontificate on topics they don't know about, like venture capitalists giving us discussions of Ukrainian defense issues. It's like, they don't know what they're talking about, right? Uh-huh. So he says, let's shift. So he shift. says, let's shift. And I was like, okay, this is going to not go well for you. Um, and, 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 he's, and he did it. I, see, I can see the meeting with the PR person. Like I do a lot of strategic thinking of like what happened in the meeting with the PR person where they go, listen, Mark, switch to Holocaust and <laughs> say, I'm, I'm a, as a Jewish person, it's offensive to me, but... I shall let them stay on the platform because free speech. That's what I think was happening. I think that was the calculation. The problem is he's inarticulate. And he said, Holocaust deniers don't mean to lie. And so in that, in that moment, 
I could have jumped in and said, you fucking idiot. Of course they mean to lie. It's their business to lie. They're toxic, horrible people. And what they're saying leads to deeper anti-Semitism. I could have done the lecture. Instead, I said, interesting. I think they mean to lie. But why don't you tell me your theory on this? Because I wanted the listener to hear how he's not, he's a, he's a nice person, but he's totally inadequate to the task he faces, which is, is to stave off the toxic waste that flows through that system. Mm -hmm. He doesn't understand the downstream effects at all. I do. I'm older. I studied history. I finished college. I educated myself. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, seriously, take a history course, Joe, like essentially. And so I was aware of where this leads. He doesn't have any idea of consequences. And so I wanted to show what the person who has unlimited power at one platform that is so dominant, the damage he can do by his ignorance. And what happened was two years later, he changed his policy to what I recommended. But it was two years of anti-Semitic bile going through the system. It doesn't have to be anti-trans, anti-Semitic, just nasty shit. It has its effect in the bloodstream of America because it's the place where a lot of people get their information. Ooh, so. I love I love that moment of thinking about you as an interviewer saying, "I'm not going to say you're an idiot," which you have said many times. He in said it himself by what he was yeah. saying. Yeah, I want to back up a Show little bit. Show not tell. Yes, I, I hear that. I hear that. I, I want to back in fourth up. Grade. And I know I have heard you say that you don't have a lot of patience for interviews that veer into you know childhood trauma and da 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 da. da. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm going to ask you some questions right. about okay. your childhood sure. because there's a psychoanalyst in Got the room, it. and I have so she's going to jump up here. Yeah. <laughs> I went to therapy once <laughs> when I was breaking up with someone. I didn't want to go. And so I went to therapy and they made me go. And I was like, oh, fine. And we're breaking up. So I'm like, okay, the last stop on the, on the relationship train is their couples therapy. So I went and the therapist said, Kara, how do you feel? And I said, I feel like watching television. <laughs> and of course, the person I was breaking up was like, see, see. And she goes, Kara, tell me why you said it. I said, I'm happy watching television. Oh. I feel like watching television. It makes me feel good. So that's what I feel like doing right now, not this. Uh, and so it was just... And that was that the was one my, trip to therapy. That was good, yeah. <laughs> it it was small care. We broke up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll come back to that. All right. um, so small Kara. Kara is a child. Yeah. Did you talk fast? Yes. And you have talked about the impact on you of losing your dad mm -hmm. when you were five. Yes. Suddenly. Mm -hmm. Aneurysm. Can you tell me a little bit about what he was like? Lovely. From what I could remember. You know, it's interesting because you don't remember things when you're young, even though it, it, it's interesting. I have, as you know, four kids. When I, my daughter is just four and we know each other so well. So yeah. I clearly really knew him. I doubt if something happened to me, she'd remember me as well. Because I don't have, I have little bits of memory about my dad, like mm -hmm. little moments. And I'm, sometimes I think I should be hypnotized so I could have more, or somewhere I wish, her, I wish, no, it's not, you can't remember it. You don't, you can't. I wish uh -huh. the brain was like a computer where you can, it is a computer, uh -huh. but it's an inadequate computer to pull up the actual memories, mm -hmm. um, which would be, it's, that's always thought of in sci-fi where everything gets recorded. But I would love to have seen that relationship, but I, it's there, but it's not accessible to me. And so, um, you know, it clearly gave me a, a moment. And there's a lot of uh, therapists that talk about it. I think there was one called The Lost That Is Forever, and I'm blanking on who the therapist was who wrote it. But when you have a childhood trauma like that, a death of a parent at that young age, half your life goes away, right? Half your life is broken. It's like losing half your friends or something. And so I think what it does for my brothers and I is we're, I think the word they were using in the, in the book was highly functional. We're highly functional and very little jars us Crisis doesn't bother us. We're very calm in a crisis. The worst thing happened to you, and you still went on. And mm -hmm. it doesn't mean you went on without hindrance, but you could see how you could overcome things. And I think that's probably a gift in a terrible way, in a weird way, because we're highly calm. We're, my brothers and I are very calm people. We never, we also have, I don't want to, I don't like the term, they don't have any fucks left to give because I very deeply care. Mm. But what are you going to do to me? 
Like I, yeah. I have an attitude like one, I could have died. My dad died at 34. He didn't know it. I could, I had a stroke later. I don't really, I'll be dead in 50 years. So I don't care if I ask you a tough question. What are you going to do? Uh-huh. Like, what are you going to do? And I think it, it creates that personality in you. So death informs everything I do. I also, you mentioned your brothers. You have two mm-hmm. brothers. Mm-hmm. I grew up one of four sisters. And, oh, cool. and they're one of five sisters. There's, I have four sisters. Um, and I think a lot about how that sh- has shaped the way that I, I, I connect through relationally mm-hmm. updating I see that. about our feelings. Yeah. You see that? Yeah. <laughs> um, how do you think having two brothers, like, do you think? I of, love them. They're great. And, and do, do you think the way that you interact is related to growing up in a house with two brothers? No, I think, no, I think we were very tight because of my dad's death. Like, and my mom was a little problematic, right? Very narcissistic and um, tried, lucky. Yeah, she tried her best, let's just say. Mm-hmm. She has some significant issues. And I think she was, we were more the adults in the relationship. And so we grew up real fast, even though we had money and everything else. And I was lucky to have a great grandmother who was very loving and kind after my dad died. So that helped. But I think we, we're a very tight team today. Uh-huh. You know, we're managing my mother who's 90, who's just, just decided, even though she's immobile, she's not like, so we work together as a group very well. Um, So I believe in families. Same thing with my big family now. Yeah. Your grandmother from West Virginia? No, she was great too. Uh, That's my dad's mom. She never really recovered from my dad dying. I think she really, really, she's a great, feisty, interesting woman, but I think that was a devastating situation for her. It was very hard for her to recover. She wasn't, she didn't wallow in it per se, but it definitely stayed with her. Her, He was beloved to her. And I, I, I now can't even imagine that happening, right? You wrote a beautiful piece in 1989 in the Washington Post about the, um, I mean, really, it, it is. is. It's sorry. still online. You can look it up. Should I say? Yeah. I, oh, I'm sorry. I'm a woman. Oh, no. You're kidding. <laughs> no, it's a beautiful piece of writing. I, I, it, and it's, a, it's, um, it's about, you're in your 20s. Yeah. Your grandmother from West Virginia says before. She before, had leukemia. She and her, and her, her, the grandfather was still living, but not well. Is that right? Yeah, at they the were. Time? She had he had gotten sick. She was taking care of him in an old yeah. folks' home or, or a senior facility. They call them now. And she got sick taking care of him. They often they'd been married for fifty years, and that often happens. Like they were very tight, and I think his illness. Then she ended up in the home on a. It feels like a country music song. It is a country yeah. music song. They were on different floors in the same home. And she was, she got leukemia. She had leukemia. And so she was dying and she was very much, she wasn't, she was a very strong person, but here she was very vulnerable. And she was like, I need you to bring him home. And he was buried in buried New York. Buried in New York. Had mm-hmm. been buried for 20 years. Yes. And it's your job mm-hmm. as somebody who's starting her career in her 20s to figure out how to get a body yes. moved from New York to West Virginia. It's complex. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but interesting. Yeah. <laughs> was. What was it like? You you write about that in, in your book. Mm-hmm. And I, uh, I, as I was reading it and thinking, wow, this is how you wrote about this in 1989. And now it's many decades later. What was it like to go back to read how you wrote about that as a young woman? Do you, did, you, did it feel, uh, I don't know, like... Um, did you feel sad that that was on your shoulders as a young woman no. to figure out? Were you proud of yourself that you'd no, figured out how to I, do know, it and I, also write about it? I go back it? and read a lot of my stuff. Again, yeah. I know I'm supposed to be like, oh, no, not me. But I'm really fantastic at my job. I'm uh-huh. sorry. I just uh-huh. am. And I go back and read that stuff. And I'm like, that was good. Yeah. What a good job, Kara. I don't remember all that. I saw a lead that I wrote the other day. Um, and I was like, hmm, that was good. I don't even remember writing the story, but I was like, well done, Swisher, very well done. Yeah. Um, and so I read some college stuff recently because I went back to my university and I was like, not bad. I can see why you're a star. Do you so. have a plot? Hmm? Do you have a plot? Like, do you know where you're going to go? Always. What do you mean? I mean, for your body after you die. Oh. Having had the experience. Oh, wow. Okay, death. Okay. Um, <laughs> I. I have a couple of theories. I used to say I'm just going to disappear, you know, like a cat sometimes does in the woods. <laughs> like, just gone. Just gone. Like, gone. Wouldn't that uh-huh. be great? Uh-huh. But I can't do that now that I have all these kids. They'd be upset. Um, but just di- disappearing was one of my things. It's just I won't be there one day. That was one of my things. I thought I'd be a hermit suddenly because I'm very gregarious. Suddenly just like I had a, a vision of myself at one point. There's a place called Hot Dog on a Stick in Los Angeles, um, and I, am, would, I don't know where this so is good. going. <laughs> okay. 
it's, it's a hot dog on a stick. I got it. It's I'm so delicious. It's corn. It's corn. Anyway, it's delicious. You should try one. And it has lemonade. The whole thing is fantastic. But the people in the store wear beautiful hats, these fantastic, horrible, colorful orange and pink hats. And they're poofy. They're really unattractive. And I love them. And so I want to work on, I want to disappear and be selling hot dogs on sticks. And every now and then someone will go, aren't you Kara Swisher? And I'll be like, no. Who is she? Okay, so it doesn't sound like you've spent a lot of time buying a burial plot. You no, have other, I don't. other things to think, no. to think about. Um, no. I want to talk to you about money. Cremation and then thrown in the face of people I don't like. Go ahead. <laughs> there you go. And a big party. I have money. I have a lot of money in my will for a big, giant fucking party. Is that true? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, I want to talk to you about money because I had the experience when I was thinking about when you moved from Washington, D.C. to the Bay Area. It's the mid-90s. Yeah. I left West Virginia and went to Stanford in 1999. Mm-hmm. And before the first dot com crash, and yeah. and so I remember I worked at a coffee shop, and I remember one of my coworkers talking about how what he was going to do with all the money he was making in tech stocks, and mm-hmm. then two weeks later, b- burst. Um, mm-hmm. It did, yeah. and. I had the response to that situation of looking around. I felt like I don't understand these people. I mm-hmm. don't understand what's happening here. And I want to get away. Mm-hmm. And I didn't end up, I have many classmates that I love who mm-hmm. worked for Google before they went public, yep. who worked for, for Tesla. And I left and went home to West Virginia. Mm-hmm. And I'm wondering what it was about not the I know you've talked about your interest in technology and its potential, mm-hmm. but what about tech people made you want to sort of devote your life to being around them? Because I think if you were around any of the any innovators, I've always been interested in innovators, cars, any invention, Leonardo da Vinci, everything like that, what creates innovation, whatever it happens to be. And so this was the current if you could go back and meet, Edison or go back and meet whoever the various creators were of various products, not just products, but things, ideas, founding fathers, Julius Caesar, Cleopatra, like you'd want to meet them. What were they actually like? And so I was on the ground floor of people who were not rich when I met them are now the richest and most powerful people in the world. And to watch their evolution and I know them and I, I can see them. And I think that's a very, it's a really exciting thing to be on the ground floor of seeing that. Now, one thing I didn't do was I turned down every single tech job I was offered. Yeah, I want to talk about that. Which makes me an idiot. Yeah, well, do you think that? Like in the, in the moment in the 90s and the early aughts when there's just crazy windfalls with people mm-hmm. you've been, they're getting wildly rich. Yeah. Did, where did you put your FOMO? Like, did you have a sense no. of like, am I, no. Money doesn't, infl- I have enough money. Like every time I want to buy something, I can, I, I do really well. I'm an entrepreneur and I've made a lot of money through my various entrepreneurial stuff. It's plenty of money. And I don't like, I'm not a big, I mean, I, I like renovating my house. That's pretty much what I like doing and buying things in hardware stores. It's so lesbian, it really is, but <laughs> there it is. Um, but ultimately I just, I was offered it and I was like, ugh, I just, one, I don't, one of, one of the people who offered me a job, I was on Facebook or wherever in the early days, I was like, one of the things I govern everything I do by, and I, I've done it at media companies and everything else, is if I don't like what I'm doing, I leave. Like, goodbye. And mostly, I am a bad employee. Uh-huh. When I know something better, I don't want to be lectured to by someone who's not. And so I'm like, why, instead of me feeling like a disgruntled employee, I'll just leave. And so recently when I did another leaving, which I tend to do, to do something else that interests me, right? Someone who was pretty high up was like, oh, why are you leaving? Nobody leaves here. And I said, yeah, I'm just going to go. I'm just going to go. And they're like, well, what is it? And I go, yeah, you know. You know, I was trying to be polite, essentially. And they finally were like, well, tell me why you're leaving. And I said, the honest truth is I don't want to talk to you anymore. <laughs> and they were like, what? And I said, I, I have so many, like, there are, like, I don't know, 14,000 minutes left in my life, and you're using up way too many of them. And I don't want to talk to you. Is that true? Yes. Did you really say that? Yes. I was like, I can't talk to you anymore. You're wasting my time. Like, and uh. it does come out of my dad's thing. I was like, minutes? Sorry. I can't do anymore. And I, 
I don't want to hear you anymore because I don't like anything you say. And so it's bothering me. And instead of me being bothered and quietly annoyed at you, I think I'll just eliminate you from my life. And it was great. And I feel good about it. So I do. So I do that a lot. I'm good at leaving. I'm really good. And in a happy way, very happily. Before we move away from money, I want to... Although I've been married, like, for a long well, time. Well, we're going to talk about family, because okay. I All do right. think that that's... You, you, you're, you, you, I'm interested how this style mm-hmm. meshes with parenting. So mm-hmm. we'll get to that. Um, well, but I never I, leave my kids. I want, so. I want to talk about seeing the way that money changes people. Mm-hmm. And you've seen many people up close. Yes, as their it lives does change have been a lot of people. Transformed. Um, and I guess... The question I have for you is, it's clear you have, you know, complicated personal relationships of respect with Mm -hmm. many of these very wealthy, influential people. I do. For example, when you were on book tour in San Francisco, there was a big onstage interview, and the person who interviewed you was Sam Altman. He did, yes. And I remember when I saw that, I was like, oh... I don't know if I want to listen to this because I don't know how I feel about Sam Altman in this moment. Mm -hmm. And he did a really good job interviewing you. Yeah. He was very charming. He is charming. And also I thought, I don't know if I want to be cozy with him in this way. I Mm -hmm. want to hear what Kara has to say, but Mm -hmm. I don't know if I trust Sam Altman. Right. And I guess I just wonder, like... How, how do you think about that? Coziness with very rich and powerful cozy? people. cozy? We were having a discussion. I think you can have discussions and not have to be... <laughs> the reason I did it that way is because I think book tours are boring, right? Uh-huh. They're boring. And so I was like, what would be interesting? People I like better interviewing me and us having a discussion because every one of those interviews was different. Therefore, uh-huh. I was... Like, uh, like Mark Cuban's was different than Sam's was different from Don Lemon's, right? They were all different. And I'm interested, I know this sounds dumb, but journalists always try to please other journalists and worry about their status. I care about the audience. What is the audience getting from it? And I care about, I, I was telling someone earlier, um, when I was at the Washington Post, Paul Fari, who was their very good media reporter for many years, he was covering media at the time. And we had something called the NBR Society, which was the nothing but readers like, we don't care about what other journalists think about us. We like, what are, what are the readers getting? And so I always, was always having a great fan, not just a fan, but a relationship with my audience because I respect them in a way that I think a lot of journalists don't. And so I was interested in creating a book, sto- book tour that was interesting to me, to the audience. That's what I was interested in. And I think you're such a talented interviewer. And I think about when it's, it's when I think about nothing but readers it's kind of like I often feel like you are the proxy for the general public that's going to absorb the costs of the decisions Correct. of these tech leaders. For example, I remember seeing you speak in San Francisco and talking about driverless cars and saying, mm-hmm. are they talking about all the truck drivers who are going to be out of that's work? Right. You talk about youth and, and social media and the problems with cell phones. And I wonder, do you, as an interviewer, I'm just, what makes what makes you interested? Do you like having conversations where you're bringing that accountability to the people in power and less so kind of doing the interviews around the people who have absorbed the cost of technologies? We do both. We've Uh done both and stuff like that. I certainly haven't done nearly enough because I do cover the business. I'm a business reporter. So I tend to cover the business people and the people doing it. I've expanded my interview slate now quite a bit. Um, But one of the things that's important is being able to say things directly to people And that can include, I really like this or I don't like this. Mm -hmm. But I think the people I cover appreciate that they're going to get what I think about it. I think I was one of the earliest people to talk about the dangers of misinformation. I think it was, we were, Recode was among the earliest to write about Uber and its problems and its CEO. We have, we've been willing to cut off ties and we're also interested in the trend itself, like of self-driving cars and things like that. And so... I think what's important is to maintain, it's not honesty, really. it's, it's using facts and then saying what you think. And I think sometimes, again, like I said, some reporters like, some people say, mm-hmm. like, stop it. <laughs> I think you're an asshole. <laughs> Prove me wrong. Like, and here's why. And I think I try to do that. And I think smart people appreciate it. I think insecure toddler people, typically men, don't like it. 
right? They don't. That's what the way it is. It's, there's women that do it too, but I like to ask the obvious question. Like, you know, and some people say, I think what you're doing, for example, I, um, when I was doing an uh, interview last night with Mira Marathi, um, who's the CTO, she's a young uh, uh, woman who's the CTO, big job, it's very unusual. CTO thing. of which company? Of OpenAI. Uh-huh. And she was leading the voice thing for that Sora thing where, where the, the, she, they were do, working on the voice. There's only one like lady voice for this AI. This is Scarlett Johansson, the Scarlett but, Johansson right, story. Right, Scarlett Johansson. Yes. And so she was doing something and then Sam big footed in and like messed up what she was doing that had nothing to do with Scarlett Johansson. And so she's like, well, that was unfortunate. I said, did he Bigfoot you? And she was like, well, I'm like, Mira. And she goes, yes. He, he has these friends and he did this thing that I was working on for months. And yes, it messed it up. And it had nothing to do with Scarlett Johansson, but he was doing sort of this look at me bullshit that these guys tend to do and messed up something and then created a real problem. And we ended up having a much more interesting discussion, which was, I think they were working on the voice before, and then he messed it up by tweeting her. It, they weren't using her voice at the beginning. It actually, factually, is not true. But what it did is it encapsulated a problem people have with AI, which is they're going to steal all our shit, right? Yeah. And use it for themselves. It's very hard to do that in the, you know, just like people don't get it intellectually, but it's like, so the way I phrase it was, Mira, whether or whether not the idea in our heads now is, Scar- is, is um, uh, Sam Altman is Ursula in The Little Mermaid, oh, and they've just stolen Ariel's voice. That's what he did. That's right. But mm-hmm. that's that mm-hmm. he got. And she started laughing. He goes, she goes, he's Ursula. And I said, he's <laughs> Ursula. Like, but now people get that. And so he is, by, by being such a clod, has created a real problem it has encapsulated what we ha- the problem we have with these tech people, which is they take all the good bits and leave us with the mess. And I think the biggest, most important quote in this book that I have been trying to do since I covered AOL, since I covered is, there's, there's a quote by Paul Virilio, which is, when they invent the ship, they invent, when you invent the ship, you invent the shipwreck. When you invent the plane, you invent the plane crash. When you invent electricity, you invent electrocution. It's a very critical quote. So my question for all of these people, I think if I had a through line for my career is, okay, the ships got made and all the rich people benefited, but who's paying for the shipwreck? We are. You had a stroke. Yes. In midlife. Yeah. A hole in your heart was discovered. That's correct. You make a joke that a lot of ex-girlfriends weren't surprised. (laughs) (laughs) You have a hole in your heart. (laughs) And I uh, think that's just a line. Well, it's a funny line. And also, mm-hmm. what I find interesting about you, Kara, mm-hmm. is I what think is that? I think that you are pugnacious and tough and like, um, and also have such a clear uh, value system mm-hmm. that is at the heart of your reporting. That's correct. I wonder w- what it's like to be parented by you. Mm -hmm. You have two adult children. Well, 19 and 22. Yeah. Adult-ish. Over 18. Yeah. Um, Two small children. Four and two. Four and two. Just describe I'm a straight white man. Nice to meet you. (laughs) Describe for us, we're seeing this version of you on stage at Tribeca Festival. Mm -hmm. Is this who you are in your household with your kids? Um, You know, Here's the thing, I, Mike. I think I'm a very good parent. I think my kids really actually like me. Um, when, it was kind of interesting. I think lesbians make the best parent, honestly. Sorry, straight people. Why do but, you think that? I don't know. I had my one of my son's girlfriends called me and said, "Oh, he's such a good boyfriend." I go, "I built him that way." <laughs> <laughs> I was like, "I made certain," you know. I just I, I think one of the things I did was I let them. One of the things I spent a lot of time, which I wasn't allowed to be, I was a closeted, being closeted gay is terrible. It's a terrible, it, it warps people to be closeted or not, or not just, I came up in a time where you couldn't and it was terrible. It was not good. It's not healthy. I think any way you don't express yourself of who you are is always unhealthy. It's, you know, when you push down, what you're, even if you're shy, whatever you happen to be, trying to be performative is always damaging, I mm. think. I think you should be the person you are. It, very hard to do. No question. And so one of the things I do is let my kids be who they are. And at the same time, I don't think I'm, I think I have rules for them and be, of behavioral, how they treat people, how they talk to people. So I think they would 
sometimes my son called me fun dad. Um, <laughs> and I am more fun. I just am. Um, because I'm just like, yeah, have the cupcake. What the hell? Like, and that's from my grandmother who used to eat dessert first because she said, you never know. Yeah, uh-huh. She always ate dessert before her main meal, which I was like, that makes a lot of sense to me. What if you choked on a, like a carrot? Well, that would suck, right? That would be the end of your life. You didn't get the cupcake. So that was her theory. And I uh-huh. thought that was a good one. Um, so one of the things is I sort of let them be them. It sounds like so cliche. I let them be themselves, but I also had, also had comments on that and, and not to cut them down. And I don't say I, you know, love them all the time. That's an obvious thing, but I think we do give, we don't, I spend as much time on my parenting as I do on my career. Like I, I, I do you, how do you? Cause I work, cause I made a job so I could be at home when I wanted to be. My time is my own, yeah. and I don't. Nobody tells me when to be places, and I like that because I can then spend time with my kids. But it's not the amount of time you spend with them. It's it's it is a little bit, but the, it's the quality of time and listening to them, talking to them. It's a very different experience. You and the daughter, I'm really spending a lot of time thinking about very carefully about how we. I feel like there's that moment where girls get where they feel lesser than. I'm waiting for that to happen. But I also, when one of my sons, when we were growing up in San, Fran- when San Francisco, which is a very, very tolerant environment, he used to have this beautiful spangly hat. It was spangly and a cowboy hat. He looked so adorable in it. And he loved it. He loved it. He wore it everywhere. And in the Castro, it's fantastic because all the drag queens were like, you look <laughs> fierce. And he'd be like, thank you. You know, and he, it, would, it was great because he lived, one of the things about San Francisco is they seem weird on the outside and they're fantastic on the inside. Most people are really warped on the inside and look normal on the outside. But there it's the opposite, uh-huh. right? So they're, in any case, um, he was wearing it. And then in third grade, it was amazing. He was like, I can't wear this anymore. It's for girls. I don't know where he got that. And I was like, where did that come from? Who, who's told him that? Like, and it, you could see a little bit of him dying. You know what mm. I mean? And it made me like sad for him because he couldn't like what he liked. And so I, I always spent a lot of time thinking, trying to cull what they're like and let them help them be what they're like. And one of the things that's been a really great... Uh, just a pleasure to me is how well my son, my older sons and my younger kids get along. And it's astonishing. I thought maybe they'd be a little bit like, oh, new kids, you're replaced, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. They love each other. And they, and I encourage that. And I encourage us to do things together. Even my ex-wife is around too, which is my, my wife now is like, really? I was like, yes, she's coming. <laughs> um, and, and one of the things is my two little kids love my ex-wife because she has a lot of toys. She loves toys. She's a, she's worked at Google. She's a techie. She's sort of in that zone. And they're always like, when's Megan coming? And I was like, well, she's not she, They're like, bummer. And I'm like, okay, she can come over. It's fine. So we try to like not take it, our problems that we had out on the kids. We spent a lot of time when we got a divorce on making sure they were better and not indulging in stupid bullshit with each other that we had problems with. We did that a lot. Uh So I don't know. They're just, my kids are great. I have great kids. They really are. They're amazing. You should be nice to your kids. That's what I say. That's who's coming up behind us. Kara Swisher, thank thank you you for being on stage with us. Thank Thank you you very much. Your book is Burn Book. Thanks. Yeah. That's Kara Swisher. Her interview podcast is called On with Kara Swisher. And the tech and interview show she hosts with Scott Galloway, Pivot, always makes me feel smarter about the ways media and tech are changing. Kara's memoir is called Burn Book, a tech love story. And we put a link in our show notes to her 1989 Washington Post essay about moving her father's remains home to West Virginia 20 years after his death. Dr. Orna Goralnik's show, Couples Therapy, just released its fourth season on Showtime. Do check it out if you haven't. This episode was produced by Zoe Azule and Cameron Drews with help from Tribeca Festival's Davy Gardner and Slate's Katie Rayford. Death, Sex, and Money is produced by Slate. Please support the production of our show by becoming a member of Slate Plus. You'll not only support our work at Depth, Sex, and Money, you'll get access to ad-free listening to our show and all of the other great shows Slate makes, like Slow Burn and Decoder Ring. Be a part of helping us build a solid foundation at Depth, Sex, and Money's new home by subscribing to Slate Plus. 
To subscribe, just click Try Free at the top of the Death, Sex, and Money show page on Apple Podcasts or visit slate.com slash DSM plus to get access wherever you listen. The Death, Sex, and Money team is Andrew Dunn, Zoe Azule, and Cameron Drews. Daisy Rosario is our senior supervising producer at Slate. Alicia Montgomery is Slate's head of audio. Thank you also to Alexandra Cole, Emily Hodgkins, and Caitlin Schneider at Slate, and to Max Ludlow, Emily Tote, Dave Lorenz, and everyone else at Tribeca, who were great hosts to us. Our theme music is by the Reverend John Delure and Steve Lewis. And if you're new to our show, welcome. We're so glad you're here. Find us and follow us on Instagram at Death, Sex, Money. And I write a weekly newsletter. You can subscribe at annasale.substack.com. And you can reach us anytime with voice memos, pep talks, questions, or critiques at deathsexmoney at slate.com. We love hearing from you. I'm Anna Sale, and this is Death, Sex, and Money from Slate. This is the story of the one. As a maintenance engineer, he hears things differently. To the untrained ear, everything on his shop floor might sound fine, but he can hear gears grinding or a belt slipping. So he steps in to fix the problem at hand before it gets out of hand. And he knows Granger's got the right product he needs to get the job done, which is music to his ears. Call, click Granger.com, or just stop by. Granger, for the ones who get it done.